stale tradition. Ritual, a good luck charm. Part of some religious checklist. Done to appease a higher being so we can get what we want. Or at least avoid the lightning bolt. Prayer has been redefined and twisted and confused. But at its essence, prayer is simply talking to God. The God who spoke the universe into creation. Who gives us life and breath. Who holds all things together. This God wants us to talk to him. In the vastness of all that exists, he actually cares about us, personally, individually. How can we not pray to such a loving God? Wherever we are, how can we not thank him for what he's done? Or cry out when we need help, when we need forgiveness, when we're afraid, when we give thanks for our blessing or question where our next meal will come from? Why would we live a life apart from him? It's not about formula. How could any posture or well-chosen word impress the author of time and space? It's simple obedience. God has made himself available to us. He wants to hear from us. He wants us to trust in him, to acknowledge our dependence on him to draw near to the one who loved us first. Approaching with confidence because Christ has torn away the veil. He's washed away the sin that kept us from his presence. And we live in relationship with our Lord. And so we ask that his kingdom come, his will be done on earth and in our lives as it is in heaven. That is prayer. All right. So if you didn't know already, last week we began a series on prayer. And, uh, and today we're going to continue that series on prayer. But it's not just going to be like, hey, this is how you pray. This is what you should be praying. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at what Jesus challenges us to do when it comes to prayer. Uh, before we get into that, though, let me ask you guys, um, have you ever heard of the phrase at-risk behavior? You guys ever heard of that? It, typically, it's used like with kids or with teens and talk about, oh my goodness, they're involved in some at-risk behavior. And typically, you might have some images that come to your mind when it comes to at-risk behavior. You might think of things like this. Let's see that next slide, right? Drinking, hooking up, bullying, you know, doing drugs. Like this is at-risk behavior. Let me suggest to you that if you're not actually encouraging, I'm talking to parents for the most part right here. Um, if you are not encouraging your your kids to be involved in at-risk behavior, uh, you're actually putting them at risk. I know that sounds weird, and don't get me wrong, I am not encouraging your eight-year-old to like go on a drinking binge. That's not what, that's not what I'm saying. Like if you've got some 16-year-old, uh, let me just tell you right now, um, probably like doing bong hits underneath the bleachers, probably not a good idea, right? That's not what I'm encouraging, but I think as parents, sometimes we do our children a disservice because there is a sense that we want to keep them safe and we want to keep them protected, but oftentimes, because we want to keep them safe and we want to keep them protected, we actually put a ceiling on all the wonderful things that they could actually experience in life. Look at it this way. When you think of just some of the things that you had to go through in order to hit some of the milestones in your life, I mean, you had to go through some really, really risky stuff. Think about those first steps that your kids have to take. Like, that's risky. I mean, they're pulling up on things, and they're taking, and they're certainly going to fall, and there could be some bruises and some scrapes along the way. That's risky. It's risky to learn how to ride a bike. I mean, to take the training wheels off? Oh, my goodness. You're definitely going to get some skin knees. That's risky. Have you ever seen a child, like, climbing in a tree, and there's just this instinct in you, in you that you just want to, like, you know, do one of these things underneath the tree? Well, it's important for them to like have those adventures so that they can have greater adventures in life. I mean, even think of swim lessons. Terrifying. Water's scary. The ocean. Waves. Oh my goodness. Risky. Taking the car out for the first time. Taking the car out on the freeway. Risky. Asking somebody out on a date. Oh my goodness. Right? So risky. But these are all things that are necessary for us to grow, to mature, to develop as people. And so as parents, as parents, what do good parents know? 
Good parents know that they actually need to sometimes gently encourage and move their kids to at-risk behavior, calculated at-risk behavior. Uh, oftentimes, you know, as parents though, maybe little Johnny comes to us and says, I don't really want to be involved in swim lessons. And you think, well, okay, fine, maybe next summer. And then next summer turns into the next summer, to the, turns into the next summer. And again, you've put that ceiling on what they get to experience in life. If they never learn how to swim, guess what that means? It means no swimming, but it also means no diving. It means no snorkeling. It means no scuba diving. It means no skiing, wakeboarding. It means no jet skis. It means that they may have a fear of water all of their life. This is what happens. And so we actually, as good parents, we move people, our kids, our friends, to risky behavior. Now, we are not doing a, a lesson on, on good parenting. Um, we're going to be talking about prayer. And I want you to keep everything in your mind when it comes to at-risk behavior. I want, to keep, uh, I want you to just kind of keep that in your mind because Jesus, almost like a good parent, is going to be challenging and he's going to be engaging us to actually have some at-risk behavior. Even just the prayers that we communicate to God are actually extremely risky. Keep that in your mind. Okay, so last week we introduced this whole series called Pray What? By examining the Lord's Prayer. And we actually picked up in Luke chapter 11. Because in Luke chapter 11, Jesus, he finishes praying. And then after he's finished praying, his disciples, disciples are so overwhelmed with like how he just prayed that they say, can you please teach us how to pray? And Jesus says, certainly, I can teach you how to pray. And he begins to teach them how to pray. But we looked at the parallel passage in Matthew. In fact, you can turn there. We're going to spend the majority of our time in Matthew chapter 6. But when Jesus starts teaching them how to pray, he first starts explaining how not to pray. He says, hey, first of all, guys, don't fake it. When you pray, don't fake it. Don't just start praying so that you can like, impress other people with how spiritual you are. Don't start praying because you want to cross something off your spiritual to-do list and you can just feel better about yourself. Like, that's not why you should pray. He also goes on and he says, hey, you know what? When you pray, don't be like the pagans who just babble on and on and on over and over again about the same requests, the same things over and over again. And somehow that would show their gods the earnestness of their heart. It's like, you don't need to do that. Don't pray like this. And then we got a reason why we don't pray like that. In verse 8, remember, we don't pray that way because what our Heavenly Father already knows what we need before we even ask, which caused us last week to ask our own question. And the question was, well, then why pray in the first place? Like, if God already knows what we want, if he already knows what we need, well, then why do we need to talk to him about it? See, this is, I think, exactly where Jesus wants us, right? He wants us having those, those moments of, of trying to figure these things out because the disciples, what do they want? They wanted to know how to pray. Jesus wants them to know why they pray. So let me ask you, why do you pray? Why are you engaged in prayer? I think for so many of us, the reason why we pray is so that we can remind God of our wishes and our wants or at least the wishes and the wants of other people. Like, this is one of the reasons why we pray. But then Jesus prays, and he instructs us on prayer, and it's so different than this. In fact, if you haven't gotten there yet, we're going to look at verse 10. Um, verse 9 really starts off with Jesus explaining exactly how to engage in prayer, and it's having just this proper perspective of who we're talking to. It's this idea that we're talking to the creator of the universe who is infinite and also intimate, right? Intimate, our Father, our Father who's in heaven. But it's also, man, he, he's infinite, holy. I mean, he's perfect, pure. There is awe that we need to have when we approach him. But then he gets into answering that question for why. What is the heart? What is the key to this type of prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, for those of you who were here last week, I hope you guys caught it. I hope this was just a reminder. Like, okay, well, why do I pray? Like, what's the heart of what Jesus is challenging us when it comes to prayer? For those of you who were not here last week, let me tell you. Well, it's all about aligning or realigning your heart with your Creator. Like, the purpose of this prayer, the purpose of prayer is actually to surrender our will, not impose our will on God. We pray not to move God, but we pray to be moved by God. Guys, this is risky. This is risky stuff. 
Because what does that mean? It means you're not in control. And you have your wishes, and you have your wants, and you've got your agenda. But Jesus says, no, 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 you need to reframe this. You need to shift this. And I know it's, it's going to feel like I'm taking the training wheels off here. And I know you're like, I don't know if I can trust. Is he going to actually come through for me? Because I want to keep praying for all those things that I'm a little worried he might not come through for me on. But he says, hey, the focus needs to be not about me. It's you first, God. Me second. Me maybe 20 second, right? This is where Jesus is moving us when it comes to prayer. And I think um, maybe some of you last week, I don't know this for sure, none of you guys communicated this to me, but I think some of you, we get so comfortable with how we were taught how to pray that maybe hearing this is a little disturbing to you because you, this is not how you were taught to pray when you were a child. And so maybe even last week, like you opened up your, your, your Bibles and you might have looked for verses to support how you have been taught to pray. And you looked at examples and you looked at stories and like, okay, he did it this way, but don't forget, this is how Jesus is teaching us to pray. And here's what I know about most of you. Maybe all of you, I don't know. I think all of you, maybe with the exception of Tim. Um, I'm teasing, I just gotta pick on Tim every once in a while. I think that, I think that you guys have shown up today because you want to go deeper in your faith, right? You don't want to have a shallow faith. Maybe 50 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, like you would have come to church because of the social like pressure and expectation that people have. Guys, those days are over. Those days are gone. If you don't want to go to church, you don't have to. And me, as your pastor, I'm not even going to show up at your house like wagging my finger like you should be. I might send a nice text saying we missed you, but that's probably the extent of it, right? You don't have to be here. And so I am confident that the vast majority of you, you are here today because you want to go deeper with your faith. You want to go deeper in your connection with God. And if that's true, let me tell you, you don't go deeper in your faith simply by gaining, gaining some knowledge. You go deeper by actually engaging in at-risk behavior. And the prayer that Jesus has challenged us to pray, oh my goodness, it's risky stuff. So all of that, all of that is actually just review. Everything I've just shared with you, we talked about last week. And so let's get into some new stuff. But before I do, I want to just stress that we can't really go any further unless you embrace this reality of surrender. That when we're talking to God, it is this you first, me second mindset. It's I'm surrendering my will. I'm moving towards your will. Because everything else that Jesus is going to have to say, it all implies, it all assumes that you've done that first step. And if you haven't, well, then the rest is going to be kind of lost on you. It might be decent information, but you're not going to go deeper in your faith. So what does he say? All right, let's look at verse 11. <clears throat> Give us today, at which point we all say, Woohoo! yes, finally, the moment where I can bring my list to God and just tell him all those cool things that I really, really want. Okay, if that's where you're at, I'm sorry. That's not, that's not where he's going. In fact, he's going to be challenging us to engage in prayer, engage in a conversation really around three different things. Uh, pastors like to use little, little uh, language uh, kind of tweaks so that you guys can remember things. There's this fun little uh, alliteration so you can actually remember where uh, Jesus is going and where he's headed. Uh, and he's going to be talking about provision. He's going to be talking about pardon. And he's going to be talking, oh, we've got it right here, protection. So the PPP, right? Okay, so this first part is all about our provision. Or is it? Let's read. Again, verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. Yes, we're supposed to be focused on the, th the things that we need, the things that we desire. But is that really the focus? Because here's the thing. Um, when... Jesus' audience first like, heard him speak these words. They were not imagining a refrigerator that only had maybe a quarter uh, of a you know, milk carton full uh, of milk um, and a pantry that only had you know, half a carton of Pringles and a Pop-Tart, right? And, and this was like a prayer of like, I need this like, filled for the entire month. Like, that's not where their minds were, were at. Uh, they, they were thinking, oh my goodness, you know what? This sounds an awful lot like how God provided for our ancestors. Some of them would have been actually picturing Moses, and they would have been picturing the Israelite people who were rescued out of slavery. And before they were able to take the promised land, they were in this space in the wilderness 
where they were actually reliant on God for literally their daily bread. I mean, what did they do? What did they do? Uh, these Israelites, every single morning, they would like crawl out of their tents and they would literally harvest from the earth their daily bread. They would harvest manna so that they could get through the next four days. So that they get through the next week. Is it the next month? Is that how much they gathered? No, you guys know the story. Like that manna would last for one day and one day only. And they had to trust that God was going to bring them more manna the next day. What was God doing with that? Like why? Well, what is God doing? He's trying to teach them, you're dependent on me for everything and I'm a God that you can trust and I will continue to meet all of your needs. I will continue to meet you with all kinds of provisions. You gotta trust me every single day for this. So Jesus is challenging us, yes, certainly, to talk to him about our, our daily needs. But there's something else in this. There's something else for our hearts because there is a reality that we live in that we don't really recognize. What is the reality that we live in today? You are dependent every single day for your life and everything that you have from God. You feel that though? Like when you wake up in the morning and you feel like, God, like provide me all that I need today. No, our problem is we typically have an excess of stuff, not less of stuff. And that does something to our hearts. Right? What does it create in our hearts? It creates almost this selfishness, this entitlement. It, it creates in us this greed that builds up in our hearts until we experience a crisis. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like we, We're pretty clever. We're pretty smart. We work hard. We get what we need until we have a crisis. And then we realize, no, no, no. Okay, I actually am completely dependent on God for everything. You have a health crisis and there's nothing the doctors can do. God, it's only you. Help me. You have a relationship breakdown and a relationship that is so meaningful to you is now falling apart. God, I can't fix this thing. I am completely reliant on you. You have some other job or employment issue. You don't have enough money. And then in those moments, like, oh my goodness, God, you are the one that provides everything for me. And we start moving towards him. But typically it only happens when we're in a crisis. And so Jesus is saying, okay, this is the time in your prayer where you stop and you pause and you start remembering, and you start reflecting, that God is the one who provides. It's not me, it's God who provides. I'm completely dependent on him. This is kind of a tough prayer, because when he says, give us today, we're thinking, time to get to that list. If you think that's hard, if you think that's risky, I'm going to, I'm going to crank up the temperature just a little bit, and we're going to, we're going to offer up another prayer that some of you, I don't know if many of you are, are, are Bible verse memorizers. I think it's really a good discipline to get into. If you're looking for the next Bible verse to read and apply to your life, write this one down. I, I want to challenge you to actually pray this next prayer in tandem with Matthew chapter 6, what we're studying now. But this one's found in Proverbs. Turn with me. Keep your finger right there in Matthew chapter 6. But turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Because what... Uh, the writer of Proverbs is going to say really lines up with what Jesus is saying. And if you pray this prayer, I'm just letting you know right now, this, this is a game changer. We're going to start reading in verse 8. It says, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty. Can you guys get behind that prayer? Right? You good, you good with that one? God, man, I really don't want to be poor. Please, like, keep me from poverty. But then notice the next part. Nor riches, huh? but give me only my daily bread. There it is. Give me my daily bread. Why? Why just the daily bread? Is this a prayer that is popular in our culture? You guys hear anyone praying these types of prayers? God, you know, I don't want to really be poor, but I really don't want to be rich either. Like, have you ever heard anyone pray that prayer? Well, there's something that happens when we do pray this prayer. There's a reason behind this prayer. Look at verse 9. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? We know people that have been down this road. Right? We know people who have gotten so much that they just kind of stop thinking about God. They have so much time for leisure and they have so much wealth that it's like, eh, God is a, an afterthought. So what does he say? 
Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Don't let me get poor. I don't want to do some sketchy stuff that's going to actually dishonor you. But I also don't want to have so much that I'm not even communicating. I'm not even connecting with you, God. God, just give me what I need for today. You guys ready to make that part of your prayer? It's risky, isn't it? Like there's some inherent risk in there because there's something in us that's a little greedy. And we would like God not just to provide, you know, the breakfast for the morning, but maybe for the entire month. We would like enough to like pay our bills today, but also like for maybe the next 50 years so we can do an early retirement. Like that's where our heart's at. But there's something that actually helps us move away from greed, move away from this entitlement. When we just say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you for my daily needs. You guys want to start praying this prayer? That would be the challenge. All right, so that's provision. Now we're moving on to the second P, which is pardon, pardon, pardon. Everybody say pardon. First one was what? Provision. The second one is? Did I say protection? And Okay, good, because I thought maybe because you said it, <laughs> that I had said it. No, Josh is just trying to mess with me is what he's doing. All right, so it's provision, pardon, and we'll get to actually protection next week. Uh, these aren't mine, by the way. I'm not that clever when it comes to alliteration. They've been around for years and years and years, right? Some other pastor uh, told me a long time ago. Okay, let's get back to this. What does he say about uh, pardon? And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Again, I think we like the first part of that one, don't we? God, forgive me. I need, I need some forgiveness. I've messed up again. It's the second part that gets risky. It gets difficult. Let's just read it one more time. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. There's a catch in this one, right? This is one of those prayer requests with a catch because there's just mm, something in us that that's going to be difficult. Let's just put this in perspective. This prayer basically says, God, forgive me in the exact same way that I have forgiven those who have wronged me. I mean, that's tough. Is that where your heart's at? Or are you holding on to some unforgiveness? See, this part of this prayer, there is this, there's probably a conversation that came before this one, right? Before we can pray this, I think for most of us, there needed to be a conversation with God that went something like this. Do you want forgiveness? Yes, Lord. More than anything, I would love your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Okay. Are you asking for me something that you are unwilling to extend to others? Are you asking for me something that you are unwilling to actually extend to others? See, if you're a Christian today, like if you call Christ, your Lord and your Savior, there is an assumption, there is an understanding that you're actually forgiving others the same way that he has forgiven you. And that, that is tricky because that's not always where our hearts want to go. You know, again, for many of us, we want to have a deeper faith. But what does a deeper faith look like? A deeper faith looks like us actually taking those risks and even forgiving those who have sinned against us. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4. If you want, just kind of keep your finger in Matthew. But in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says this, <clears throat> Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. forgive people? No, not that person. You don't know what she did. You don't know what he's done. Yeah, I'm going to hold on to that one. Well, again, we don't actually forgive people because they deserve our forgiveness. We forgive because that's how God has treated you and I. Well, let's just do a 360 for a moment in our relationships. I just want you to kind of imagine some people in your life. Uh, maybe it's an ex-wife. Maybe it's an ex-husband. Maybe it's, maybe it's someone you dated. Uh, someone you wish you hadn't dated. Uh, think about maybe that neighbor that you've had a few run-ins with. Uh, think about that coworker who just is a real gem, right? Every morning, you just love to see that guy or that girl. Maybe think of 
Maybe think of a, a boss or a manager, maybe a former boss, former manager. Uh, think about that student at your school, maybe a group of students at your school that you wish were part of any other school than your school. Maybe think about that family member who makes every holiday just a little bit more miserable, right? Like, think about those individuals. And now I want you to ask yourself a question. I want you to ask, am I, am I withholding something from them that I expect God to give me? Forgiveness. Am I withholding something from them that I'm actually kind of expecting that God is going to give to me? Do you guys know what we call people who expect others to do things that they themselves aren't willing to do? What do we call those people? We call them hypocrites. You guys want to be a hypocrite? Jesus doesn't want you to be a hypocrite. So he says, hey, are you forgiving? Are you forgiving the way I have forgiven you? And it's more than just Jesus like saying, hey, don't be a hypocrite. He understands what happens to a heart that holds on to unforgiveness. He understands that when we hold on to unforgiveness, we actually begin to rot from the inside out. And he wants the proper king on the throne of your heart. God alone is the proper king who's supposed to be on the throne of your heart. But when we hold on to unforgiveness, you know who else takes the throne? Bitterness, anger, resentment. And guys, it rots you from the inside out. You become someone who looks nothing like Jesus because Jesus forgave. This is how he lived his life, and this is how he's challenging us to live our lives. In fact, this was so important to Jesus that he doubles back on it. Do you guys know how the Lord's Prayer ends? Some of you probably memorized this before. Do you guys know how the Lord's Prayer ends? It doesn't end with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Right, how many of you guys memorized that? Some of you did. Okay, that's not actually in the Bible. That's, that's something that uh, a scribe added into Scripture who knows how many hundreds of years ago. It got into the King James Version. It's probably not in many of yours unless you have the, the old King James Version. This is how Jesus ends his instruction on prayer. Matthew chapter 6, let's look at verse 14. This is how big of a deal this is. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whoa, 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 Jonathan, that is not what I remember memorizing. I remember getting like two starbursts and a gold star next to my name in Sunday school, and I'm pretty sure it ended with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen, right? Well, if Jesus was writing a song, maybe he would have ended it that way, but that's not how he ended it. Instead, he doubles back on this issue of forgiveness. Why? Because this is, this is like I'm on the top of the high dive, and my toes are hanging off the edge, and everything in me knows, okay, Jesus has forgiven me. I'm supposed to forgive these folks, but my goodness, I don't want to. That is so risky. I feel like if I forgive them, I'm, I'm basically saying what they did was okay. If I forgive them, I'm basically saying that, you know, I, that I can't hold on to this anymore. Understand, we don't forgive because they deserve the forgiveness, or because what they did wasn't wrong. We forgive because this is what Jesus has done for us, and this is the only way to experience true health spiritually. Go deeper in your faith. This is the only way. Otherwise, you're that kid who's just like, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of the water, Dad. You know what? I, I, I'm gonna convince you, Dad, I'm gonna convince you, Mom, that I actually enjoy hanging out on the side of the pool way more than playing Marco Polo with my friends. Man, I, I just, you know, honestly, Dad, like the direct sunlight that I'm experiencing right now and, and the skin cancer that I'm going to experience later on in life, like this is better than swimming around, like doing cannonballs into the pool. Your Heavenly Father says, no, no, that's not better for you. Let me encourage you to actually engage in some at-risk behavior. Forgive. Forgive. And here's the thing, I know some of you, you're not there right now. And if that's where you're at, that's okay. Uh, can we at least challenge, can we at least encourage you to begin thinking about forgiveness? Because right now, in this moment, maybe God needs to do some work in your heart because you've got this, you just, your, heart, your heart's been hard for so long. 
But here's the thing. If you stay there, I'm just letting you know right up front, if you stay in that position, you can't move forward with this prayer or even with a deeper faith. Like everything that Jesus is going to say, even from here on out, it assumes surrender. It assumes that you are living this out. And if you can't live this out, guys, you're missing out on a critical aspect of actually walking with Christ and like Christ. you got to, you got to dig deeper into this. Um, how many of you are familiar with the name Ruby Bridges? Anyone? Okay. Uh, my guess is if you can't remember exactly why you know that name, um, you're probably going to understand once you see this picture. All right, let's see that next picture. Okay, so Ruby is that little girl <clears throat> in the middle of these two U.S. Marshals, or I should say four U.S. Marshals. And uh, this, was, this was painted by Norman Rockwell uh, back in the 1960s. Um, Ruby was the first African-American um, who was re required in the South to actually integrate into an all-white school. And uh, this was tough because, you know, she, it, this is her very first day of school. So imagine, did any of you have like a rough first day of school? <clears throat> first day of school for anyone is rough. Imagine being in first grade, you're six years old, you've never been to school before, and you are tasked with integrating into an all-white school where people are not excited. In fact, they're so not excited that hundreds and hundreds of people show up every single morning to heckle you. Uh, they show up to scream, yell, spit on you. Uh, later on, Ruby actually talks about one protester having, uh, holding a, um, a black doll in a coffin. I mean, that's intense stuff. And so Ruby goes to her first day of school in that type of climate. And you can imagine, that, that's going to be tough for a kid. And so she actually started having some nightmares. Uh, each time she had a nightmare, she would go into her parents' bedroom and wake them up. And mom would say the same things every single time. Say, Ruby, did you remember to say your prayers? And this is what Ruby says in a book that she wrote about the experience later in life. She says, somehow it always worked. Kneeling at the side of my bed and talking with the Lord made everything okay. My mother and my pastor always said, you have to pray for your enemies and people who do wrong. So that's what I did. And there was, um, there was a psychologist named Dr. Coles who was concerned about Ruby and just knowing the trauma that she was going through, he just wanted to monitor what she was uh, experiencing. And one of the things that he found really fascinating was that she didn't seem to exhibit any of the things that normal kids under that type of traumatic experience uh, exhibited. Like there was no acting out, there was no anger, there was no depression, there was no insecurities. Other than those nightmares, like she was doing really well, but he monitored uh, the situation. And one day as she's walking to class, Again, she's got the U.S. Marshals. Uh, she stops, and all the yelling, all the screaming continues, and she faces the crowd, and she begins to say something under her breath. And there's a teacher who is observing this, but she's not close enough to actually hear Ruby's words. And so afterwards, she reports this to Dr. Coles, and Dr. Coles later that day said, Ruby, sat her down and said, Ruby, uh, we noticed that you were saying something to the crowd. What were you communicating? What were you telling the crowd? And she, in a nice, sweet little voice, said, oh, no, no, Mr. Coles, um, I wasn't actually talking to the crowd. I was praying for the crowd. And what's amazing about Ruby is her parents grew up not knowing how to write, not knowing how to read, but they understood the importance of God's truth found in Scripture. And so they taught her the way that Jesus lived his life. And they challenged her to live as Jesus lived. And Jesus said to forgive those who sin against you. And so that's what she did. And that's what Jesus is calling all of us to do. And I know some of you, you're just not there. It's just like, John, I can't, I, I'm not there. But just don't forget, that's exactly what Jesus did for you. Let's pray. Father God, we know that you call us into deep waters. Father, we know that you don't want to allow us to stay the same because right now we are, we are just poor reflections of you and, and there's growth that needs to take place. And so God, in this moment, as we start to think through maybe areas and, and places in our life where we put ourselves and our 
own self-importance in front of you, not recognizing you as the God who provides, not recognizing you as the God who sustains. Father, I pray that you would you convict in that area. And if there's areas of unforgiveness in our life, God, convict in that area as well. Give us the strength, give us the ability to actually live a far freer life, stepping into that risky behavior of forgiving just the way you have forgiven us. I pray this in your son Jesus' name, amen.